but there is very little understanding of the needs of those who are in prison now or who may face prison. We bought you the best kit and had it branded. Lord Hastings, it's lovely to meet you. I'm really looking forward to getting to know you a bit better. I want to start with your early childhood. Tell me what was that like? England, the northwest, <laughs> uh, born in Widnes. My father was a dental surgeon, and in 1966, my father decided we should move to the Caribbean, to Jamaica. Being a medical specialist, the option was there for joining the Jamaican Health Service. He was keen on that because that's where he'd met my mother anyway. So off we all went, 1966, and we cruised for three weeks and we ended up in Kingston, Jamaica, and then traveled across the island, and then finally settled in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and then that's where my brother and I went to school. Uh, my father was a very deep, professional, medical expert type. Mother was very energetic, but growing up in an environment where generosity and kindness was constant. When you decided to be a teacher, was that informed in part by your own schooling? Was it seeing teachers at work and thinking, I could do this? What, what was it that made you decide to be a teacher? I just was very motivated that teaching is such, a, is such, an, amazing, is such an amazing gift to give to others. You know, we learn best when we share what we know. From teaching, then you move closer to government. How does that happen? The way it happened was that 1981, 1985, there had been a series of urban disturbances all over the UK. There had been 21 cities that had experienced riots, and all the riots had been uh, mainly black communities who were very disturbed by high levels of unemployment. We were changing from traditional manufacturing and a coal-based economy into a more technological, modern-based economy. And there were losses. There were very heavy losses. Unemployment became extremely high, and, and it particularly affected black, displaced, and minority communities. And you know, Martin Luther King said that you know, riots are the language of the unheard. And so people rioted. There was I, as a school teacher at half term, sitting at home by my desk, preparing lessons and the phone rings and it's someone from number 10 who I haven't seen for six years and he basically says to me can I come in and have a conversation in number 10 within 24 hours and it was we need a conduit we need somebody black who can be a conduit to the conflicted angry communities who feel the government is against them there's no money to provide employment there's no training for skills and development and basically we need you to find a route to make these nexuses come together and that's what I left teaching and did that. So how did you start that conversation? How were you able to help everybody build trust, to trust each other, to move forward? Well the, the art of all trust is time. And When you spend time with people and they come to believe that you've got their best intentions, you can then make the links. And we were able to make the links to the civil service community who had the money to unleash the employment and development schemes that would set people back on a track to work and rebuild hope. So at this point, you're then asked to become a broadcaster. Tell me about that. So I get called in by the chairman of, of a commercial breakfast television station, TVAM. Uh, to do research and then to be a presenter. And then I was then moved to GMTV to be chief political correspondent, another breakfast television station. And then the BBC rings up. And I get the opportunity to do BBC Two politics presenting on a Sunday afternoon. It's called Around Westminster. Greatly enjoyed it. Educational reporting in the week. And then the Director General's office rings up and says, let's have a chat. And the chat was, we've seen you be very equivalent on camera with all sides. And, um, and basically they say, we need someone to be a lobbyist. And we think you're pretty even-handed. 
So would you fancy coming behind the camera? You play a leading role in changing the face of the BBC, how it thinks, how it behaves. It became very important work. Yes, I was given the opportunity to fight to protect the BBC's financing, the licence fee, and, and I got the chance to help shape how the BBC saw itself as not just a provider of programmes and an informer, but an impactor of the world that it was in and is in. And then the Director General, Greg Dyke, invited me to commence corporate social responsibility for the BBC. And so I had the chance to say, you know, as the nation's premier broadcaster um, and, and, and the biggest international face that Britain has to the world beyond, we also have the chance for all these wonderful 25,000 people in this organization to be a positive front face for community change. Let's get out of the bunker of Broadcasting House and out of the bunker of Television Centre and let's meet the people out there who pay our way and be engaged with them in shaping the better things for their future. So you take all of that change-making energy, all of that experience and know-how to KPMG. Yes, I, I go to KPMG at the invitation of the chairman and help to create a culture of, again, the duty of an organization full of brilliant professionals and ask the question in every case, every city, every country, what can we do to deliver the best possible impact for the people we seek to serve? And I'd had, from the age of 16, I'd had a running mantra through my DNA, which was that I was asked at 16, you know, what do you want to do with, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, um, I want to speak up for the poor and I want to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. And I got to do that at the BBC. I got to do that working with the Thatcher government. I got to do that in education. I got to do that in a big business consultancy. I got to speak up for the poor and bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. So I know you're very, very proud and still very passionately driven to continue working with prisoners as humans, finding out much more about their lives. Tell me about that. Well, I went to visit um, a man who'd been involved in a serious crime as a friend of a friend. And in visiting this person, I discovered that unlike the scenarios out there that uh, uh, many who've been involved in serious crime are threatening, violent, unkind, this person was warm, open, reasonable, interesting, honest, transparent, and Having built this close conversation with this man, officers then invited us to come back, and that was the beginning of a small group, and that's expanded now to three prisons, and there are many more that it will expand to. And there's a team of people who work with us and do it, and it's a entirely voluntary, 100% unpaid, every two months, life-giving, joyful experience. And your work in prisons was also about allowing these prisoners to go on and have lives and fulfill their potential. Well, I, I've, I've come to see, to realise and to believe that even if someone has committed a crime of great seriousness and discomfort to wider society, they're still a human being of, of intrinsic value. They still have to become a citizen of value to the wider world at some point. And our task is to walk the journey with them to give them the hope and certainty of love and to engage with their mind in such a way that they believe the best of themselves. Many of those we've also met have been the subject of miscarriages of justice. I've read so many cases which do not add up. And getting those cases reheard through the system is something we also seek to do. So defending them when they are meant to be accused and helping them when accused and convicted to become the best person they always wanted to be. And is there any particular tool of, or way that you've found that can really deepen those relationships? Building trust is, is very important because the system says we don't trust you so we lock you up. And in a lot of their early lives they've been distrusted and then they come into prison and it's all about disconnection and officers and controls and we're looking for this magic extra something 
to connect with them. And we said, football, that's it. Morning, gentlemen. Hello. Um, I'm Michael. I'm also a lord, so I'm Lord Hastings. You can call me anything you like. Michael's fine. But I'm a member of parliament in the upper house. So the queen appointed me. I don't get elected, but I'm here to serve you. And we're all here to serve you. Part of our gift to you is we've, we've bought you the best kit and had it branded. And so you, this is so you can keep it. It's 100% yours. We have a blue kit. Yours is an orange kit. So you can pick them up in a minute. Right, the food is ready. Do you want to grab some food? And then we're going to be on the pitch. I think for me, the, the lack of hope is really, um, is really impactful. This is hard to quantify. Yes, it is. Um, and it's not something you can just pluck off the shelf and deliver. Um, I think it comes from a genuine place. So I think giving them a structure and giving them some hope and giving them some direction and some support, yeah. some of these lads will hopefully and will, you know, um, transition into the community and you know with the sort of support that you and you and the chaps can give them will be fantastic and they will be citizens yeah exactly because their minds are open yeah you can tell yeah. from the beginning if i may remind the house in the last gracious speech in december 2019 we had the promise of a royal commission on the criminal justice system. Now it has been abandoned, unless the minister in his reply is able to tell us it'll be coming back. That is a massive disappointment to all of us who've been concerned about the reality of justice to those who feel miscarriage rather than fairness is the normal experience. How did you become a member of the House of Lords? The, the truth is that um, I was driving into London one day, working for the BBC, and the phone rang again, and it was Paddy Ashdown. Um, well, he actually said, would I be willing to accept a, a peerage from the Liberal Democrats? And I, I had to say no, uh, on the spot almost, because the BBC was impartial. I couldn't possibly accept something that would make me partial politically. So um, I left it, and uh, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, set up the independent Appointments Commission, which has a Conservative, a Labour, a Liberal Democrat member, and three independent members and an independent chair. And they came to me. And so I then said yes. Tell me about when you were initially part of the Lords. What did you decide to focus on? Well, I began, because I'd been, um, I'd been at the BBC, I began by joining the Broadcasting Select Committee. But as my role in KPMG got bigger and bigger and bigger, I couldn't commit to the dates. Um, but then the opportunity came for the 200th anniversary of the um, Eradication of Slavery Act that William Wilberforce had pursued through both houses to ensure that the, the British government's role in facilitating and financing slavery was brought to an end. So I led a day's campaign a day's activism and a day's debate on William Wilberforce and his life. And I was so proud of that because he was the liberator for the very people from whom I am birthed. Tell me about what you're particularly proud of. I'm particularly proud of the people that I get to see who make their choices to change their own lives. And I can stand in the background or behind with them and help them to make better choices. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of their will to transform. I'm proud of being associated with people in the countries of the world, particularly across the continent of Africa. I've been able to visit 16 countries. I've seen the worst of the worst and the best of the best. And I'm proud of, of people who are on the margins of life that other people have no time for who I find to be wonderful and warm and open. I'm proud of them. That's what I'm really proud of. I'm proud of seeing other people achieve their potential. 
What we do here is build relationships with the young guys and our aim is to build connections between a group of men, some of whom have gone to prison and come out, others who've never been in prison but have lived tough lives on the streets and been around in the harder areas of London. And by building mentoring connections, we want to give the young men here hope, freedom, opportunity, connections, and a real sense that they're loved and their lives matter. I'll never let, I'll I'll never let, let success get to my head. Success get to my head. Or failure to my heart. Or failure to my heart. I will not go to the grave with my dreams. I will not go to the grave with my dreams. Amen. Thank you.